Sorry, but I had another moderation all the way downstairs. And I'm getting old, but uh, we managed and um, we will talk about the uh, feeling of insecurity. And um, as we know that the feeling of insecurity is a feeling, so it's rather subjective than objective. So we have to deal with people and their emotions and their feelings. And that's a rather a, um, difficult task um, where as a community we, we have to find ways to, um, to address the emotional side in people and rather the, the rational side. Um, and we know from research that uh, people that are objectively have a lower um, possibility of becoming a real victim of crime, have a high feeling of insecurity, for example, old or older people, and maybe younger people that are on the streets at night and get in a lot of trouble and become victims here and there, they have a low um, fear of insecurity. They feel very secure, even though they become much often victims. That's the a paradox in this, in this work, and it shows that it's um, crucial and it's not um, easy to find solutions how to address these feelings of insecurity um, of the citizens in a community context. And now we have two experts here who dedicated their life um, with exactly this research, a part of your life, I, I hope. Um, but I, I looked uh, this morning, um, I think in 2012, you were the first time here in Munich, right? Or was it even yeah. before that? No, it was the Munich Congress, the 17th, the 17th German Congress. They were the first time here and ever since they returned almost every year and um, want to present yeah, their findings, their research findings and practical findings. And today it's about, um, it's about uh, insecurity. Um, the perception, impact, and handling of feelings of insecurity. And these two people are um, Caroline Davy and Andrew uh, Wooten from the uh, University of um, Salford, right? Salford, yeah, in the UK. And um, Caroline, uh, Caroline is a um, professor of... Um, uh, at, at the university, and um, David is a um, senior researcher at the at the same institute, and they have a lot of uh, connections to the German, to the German uh, practice side, to the German police in Lower Saxony. I think, I think you you can uh, include this in your presentation. Okay, so the floor is yours. Thank you. You want us? Thank you very much. Yes, Mark's quite right. We did. We came one time in 2012 and been coming back ever since and also working very closely with the Deutsche Präventions Tag and also with the Landeskriminalamt and they are here today as well and various other partners from our project. So we're very happy to be surrounded by friends today. So I'm Caroline Davy. I'm Professor of Design, Innovation and Society at the University of Salford. And together with Andrew Wootham, I'm Director of the Design Against Crime Solutions Centre. We're delighted to be at the DPT Congress once again, and in person, and to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our experience delivering EU security research and innovation projects and specifically to talk about our EU-funded Cutting Crime Impact project 
and the human-centered approach that we adopt to understand citizens' feelings of insecurity and develop practical tools for use by law enforcement. We run the Design Against Crime Solutions Centre at the University of Salford, which was established in 2005. The centre is a strategic partnership with Greater Manchester Police in the UK, the Landis Criminal Amt in Lower Saxony, and DSP Group, a research and urban planning consultancy in the Netherlands. This partnership allows us to gain insight into real-world issues facing security practitioners and to work with them in collaborative research projects addressing security challenges. Our research has evolved over the past two decades, leading national and international research projects in which we use design research to understand and innovate around complex issues such as those listed here. Over this period, we have delivered a range of different projects and I'd like to talk to you today about one of these projects we completed, I say recently, but it was a little while ago now, <laughs> but it's all gone so quickly, which is cutting crime impact. CCI was about practice-based innovation in preventing, investigating and mitigating high impact crime, petty crime. Just to say, petty crime was a term used in the original EU funding call to differentiate the everyday crimes CCI dealt with, such as burglary, robbery, assault, from organized crime and terrorism. In English, petty means small or insignificant. However, such crimes are not insignificant, rather they impact citizens' quality of life and foster feelings of insecurity. Such petty crimes should continue to be a focus for research funding programs and not be neglected due to concern about serious crime or terrorism. The CCI consortium included six law enforcement agencies, or LEAs, from across Europe. Our partners in the Solution Centre, Greater Manchester Police and the Landis Criminal Amt in Lower Saxony, as well as the Dutch Police, the Estonian Police and Border Guard, and the police forces in Lisbon and Catalonia. The consortium was coordinated by Salford and also included other non-LEA partners focusing on research, networking and communication design and includes, of course, the DPT. The CCI project was a practical one to support our six law enforcement agencies in researching and innovating practical evidence-based tools that met end-user needs and suited their operational context. CCI had four focus areas, which importantly were chosen by our LEA partners. Predictive policing, community policing, crime prevention through urban design and planning, measuring and mitigating citizens' feelings of insecurity. Today, we'd like to focus on the area selected by two of our LEA partners, measuring and mitigating citizens' feelings of insecurity. The focus area is chosen by the LKA in Lower Saxony and the Ministry of Interior in Catalonia. Okay, so firstly, um, we'll discuss the challenge of measuring crime and insecurity. So the concept of crime is widely understood uh, and we can say it's a very stable concept. It's clearly defined by police and academics. There have been some changes to precise categories of crime over time. For example, things like antisocial behaviour and stalking are now recognised as crime in the UK. Things like rape within marriage is now no longer considered lawful. And there are some minor differences in terminology in different countries. And crime is normally classified into different categories and it's recognised that there are some variations in crime levels and the ways crimes are committed, or the modus operandi, across different countries. But nevertheless, it's fair to say that it's a, a fairly stable, well understood concept. In terms of measuring the occurrence of crime, it's measured over time and across different contexts. Traditionally, this was done using the International Crime Victimization Survey, which disappointingly is no longer running. 
Uh, but participants are asked about their experience of crime over the previous, previous year with different crime types being clearly defined. So crime occurrence is measured uh, using a standardised methodology and this helps overcome some of the issues uh, that other data sources might have. For example, police recorded crime data uh, can be categorised and reported differently in different countries. So a standardised methodology allows comparisons between countries and over time and helps to better identify causes of crime and evaluate uh, prevention strategies. What has happened is that standardised surveys have been adapted to include so-called fear of crime and this we feel is problematic. Doing this, you're using an objective tool to measure something that, uh, as Mark said earlier, is actually very subjective. Uh, and in addition, fear is not necessarily related to the occurrence of crime at all. Um, the results of such fear of crime surveys are often used as a proxy for uh, police performance, uh, being conflated with things like confidence in policing and generally being used as a bit of a political football. Um, the issue, of course, is that crime surveys are relatively easy to administer, relatively cheap uh, and relatively popular amongst politicians, the media. Um, so historically, the so-called fear of crime has been built on a methodology for collecting data on crime victimisation, uh, a handy methodology to which we can add a few more questions at the end. But this methodology for measuring the occurrence of fear of crime isn't built on a clear framing of the concept of fear of crime. And furthermore, the methodology isn't built on a clear idea of how the results of such measurement can actually inform action by practitioners and policymakers. So, so what's going on? We suggest that effectively we have a body of practice that's been established uh, to become an established methodology, i.e. the Crime Victimisation Survey. And having built this solid methodology, some questions then uh, attempted to measure fear of crime have been added on top of it. And the problem is that the crime surveys are built on a very sound understanding of the concept of crime, which has allowed refinement of the methodology over time. Whereas the fear of crime survey, in contrast, seems to be built on the existence of the crime survey uh, and doesn't really have a very strong conceptual foundation. So in effect, what we're saying is that while crime is a very stable concept built on a solid foundation, fear of crime has rather less solid foundations. So when measuring feelings of insecurity, Currently, a rather narrow, objective approach is adopted. Firstly, the concept of fear of crime is used, and this is based on the concept of crime as defined in the victimisation surveys, with negative, uh, with negative reported perceptions of such crime framed as fear. And the problem with this approach is that the concept of fear is not an appropriate term, really, in return to in relation to certain crime types. Fear of crime is not necessarily caused by uh, certain crime types. Um, and in fact, fear of crime isn't necessarily caused by the threat of victimisation uh, and could be, for example, the results of the concept of uh, result of factors relating to uh, that respondents will associate with crime, such as uh, the way the environment is uh, designed. So low levels of victimisation don't necessarily mean low levels of fear. In fact, people with low risk of crime may report higher levels of fear. Uh, and this can be linked to the concept of the worried well used in the healthcare sector. Of course, high risk of victimisation doesn't necessarily result in higher levels of fear either. It's important to remember that the subjective experience of fear will be different for different individuals, groups and cultures. This is not just an academic issue, but can negatively impact society. Such surveys may actually magnify the problem of insecurity. Respondents may actually be answering survey questions on insecurity in a political manner. For example, residents may give a response they hope might result in improvements in their neighbourhood. Responses 
may, might simply be a comment on perceived police or local authority performance or even national government policy with regard to law enforcement. And such responses may overrepresent the views of certain groups while underrepresenting those of others. So in the next section, part two, we'll explore what is meant by fear and insecurity and some of the work done in cutting crime impact around this issue. So we've touched on the issues of terminology in talking about fear of crime, but we also have problems with the term feelings of insecurity. What does the term really mean? What assumptions does it communicate? We already use the term insecurity in multiple contexts. We talk about job insecurity, financial insecurity, even emotional insecurity. It's such a broad and frankly vague term. How can it realistically be addressed by law enforcement agencies? And given that, what does an LEA's responsibility for citizens' feelings of insecurity begin and end? Yes, uh, the police are not anesthesiologists uh, in terms of uh, some of the uh, films that we've seen where the population is generally drugged to keep them compliant and happy. Um, and that isn't a role for law enforcement. So the CCI project attempted to better frame the concept of feelings of insecurity to move from the vague to the specific and to better conceptualize it so that the issues of feelings of insecurity could be better got hold of, so to speak, uh, and tackled more effectively. So the CCI project adopted a design approach when tackling feelings of insecurity. And what design needs is constraints, requirements, and generally focus. So to give an example, let's consider the problem of hunger. It's big, it's vague, it's very systemic, and without more context, it's a very ill-defined problem. But by focusing on specific scenarios, that is humans in particular situations or contexts, we can make the intervention or make an intervention more feasible. So let's consider the problem of hunger in a specific scenario. That is the impact of hunger on a child's ability to learn and make good educational progress. Now, research by University College London in 2019 identified, frighteningly, that the number of children living in poverty in the UK had increased to 3.7 million, uh, with researchers identifying some youngsters as surviving on just two pounds a day for food, and that those from the most deprived families simply do not eat during the day. So a feasible intervention then to address this scenario is a breakfast clubs where children whose parents can't afford to provide them with a regular meal get to eat a healthy breakfast before starting school, resulting in reduced hunger and improved educational performance. So we suggest efforts to mitigate feelings of insecurity should focus around issues or contexts of harm such harm might be positive activities from which citizens are deterred because of feelings of insecurity. And these might be socially desirable activities like recycling or using public transport. Or the harm may be locations or facilities from which citizens feel excluded because of their feeling of insecurity. And of course, these harms may affect certain citizen groups or communities or demographics more than others, like the women, the elderly, socially deprived or migrants. So to summarise, from a human centred perspective, efforts to address feelings of insecurity should focus on where this causes harm to citizens. Such harms might include deterrence from positive socially desirable activities or exclusion from specific locations or facilities. And Concern with feelings of insecurity should focus on those citizens that experience such harms, their demographics and the particular context or the situations this occurs, what we term and what we used in, in CCI scenarios. And a final thought on the terminology. Um, we suggest the term feelings of insecurity is too vague and easily misunderstood and misapplied to be very useful. 
And we're aware that this is likely to be an issue with the English language, which generally uses the same word for very different meanings. Um, and so we suggest a better and perhaps more precise term might be um, feelings of unsafety. Uh, and conceptually, this is where the CCI feelings of unsafety model begins. So the first part of the conceptual model that we built in CCI around feelings of unsafety is uh, assumed situational vulnerability. So this is what we call contextualized anxiety in that it's anxiety about a location or an activity based on assumptions. So it's before a person is actually in that situation or doing that activity. For example, someone feeling anxious about visiting a location before they leave the house and actually get there. The next stage is situational anxiety, feelings of unsafety or anxiety experienced when in a particular context or environment. And this is feeling anxious when walking through a poorly lit public space at night, for example. And we reserve the use of the term fear for the stage that immediately precedes the person becoming a victim of crime. So this is the sense of immediate threat felt before a crime incident, before being victimized in some way, be that a robbery, assault, or other crime type. And victimization is then followed by shock, anger, distress. This is the immediate impact of the crime incident on a person, which is followed by what we term handling or dealing with victimization. And that's the longer term impact of the experience of victimization on the individual, which in turn results in a modification of the person's perspective, what we call a radical, a ra sorry, a rationalized context of vulnerability. The internal dialogue might be, for example, I walk through that location, which I previously thought was perfectly safe, but because of my negative experience, that's my victimization, I now realize I'm not safe in that location and I'm vulnerable in that location. So their perception has changed. So we can see that the life cycle model includes different stages that relate to pre-victimization factors and what we term post-victimization effects. And we can number these stages uh, with respect to their distance from the victimization experience, minus three through to plus three. But as we pointed out earlier, a person doesn't need to be victimized in a context to have their negative feelings of unsafety reinforced. So it's perfectly possible to move from stage minus two, situational anxiety, to stage plus three, modified perspective. For example, situational anxiety in an environment that is badly designed, poorly managed and maintained can cause a person to negatively modify their perspective about a location. Basically, their experience of a location was worse than they assumed it would be. So this allows us to distinguish the stages in the model where feelings of unsafety specifically relate to the experience of crime and victimization. And we can see that it's a cycle. As the modified perspective, clearly in stage plus three, feeds into assumptions about situational vulnerability made at stage minus three. But equally, any modified perspective uh, will be shared and will involve uh, will inform the views of family and friends and neighbours when a person shares their experiences of victimisation or unsafety, creating a shared local worldview, which itself informs a broader societal context, shaping societal concerns, anxieties and ultimately political priorities. And this background context through traditional media and increasingly social media also informs the assumptions of situational vulnerability made by a person. So that's the feeling of unsafety life cycle developed by CCI. And we believe it's a practical way of conceptualizing insecurity or feelings of unsafety. Because at each stage of the model, there are potentially positive and negative factors, ways of increasing or reducing uh, and making worse or making better the, uh, the impact of a particular stage on the citizen. And we, we used this model at a design lab workshop that we held uh, with our partner Francesco sitting over there in Barcelona um, uh, to, 
to do a, a design lab workshop with our partners to address four different real world scenarios relating to citizens' feelings of safety in two of our LEA partner cities, Hanover and Barcelona. And in the next part, Caroline will talk briefly about one of the CCI tools developed by our partners to address citizens' feelings of unsafety. Thank you. So CCI supported the Department of Interior in Catalonia to better understand and address citizens' feelings of insecurity, working together with Francesc to develop a tool, Perception Matters. The problem area that Barcelona was looking at related to outbreaks of insecurity including complaints from citizens who felt unsafe, sometimes resulting in public pr protests. Such symptoms resulted in political pressure to have a rapid response, with communication between City Hall and local citizens being extremely poor and potential disruption to the city area and its citizens. However, the danger with a speedy response is that while it makes good headlines, you don't address the underlying cause of the feelings of insecurity. Historically, the police of Barcelona have relied on police presence and visibility as a response to such outbreaks, but the root cause was never actually understood or addressed. Research undertaken in Barcelona as part of CCI led to the Perception Matters tool. The tool consists of five booklets in a folder. The first booklet and folders include the protest protocol, which guides the user through the perception matters process. The second booklet contains criteria for when an immediate response is necessary and what this response might be. Booklet three contains a number of tools and methodologies for understanding the problem and developing appropriate responses. Booklet four provides a guide to respond in the medium to longer term. And the final booklet is a communication kit and includes training for members of the prevention services, criminologists, police officers, and other professionals involved in using the tool. These five elements were contained in a bespoke folder for ease of distribution. The Perception Matters tool was demonstrated in Barcelona as part of CCI, launched in 2021, and is now being used by the police to help them better understand the causes of citizens' feelings of unsafety and respond more effectively. Importantly, Catalonia and the rest of Spain now has a tool to better understand and effectively address any future problems of insecurity that emerge. Okay, so in conclusion, our research on CCI raised two main issues with regard to citizens' feelings of insecurity. Firstly, what is it that we're actually trying to measure? Using a survey to measure citizens' experience of crime victimization seems to work well, but feelings of insecurity, uh, using surveys to do this, is, is problematic in that it's not at all clear what the response to such surveys actually means in a practical sense. Which brings us to the second issue. What exactly are we trying to measure feelings of insecurity for? What is the purpose of these surveys? Who are they meant to help aside from academics? And if the proposed, if, the, if it's supposed to help practitioners and policymakers, how are they then meant to use them? This is where the human-centered design approach proves useful. By focusing on the capabilities, agency, and responsibility of the humans in any design system, it offers an alternative perspective. So using a well-known example, the design of an aeroplane, from a traditional perspective, we might say that it's the purpose of the pilot to fly the designed aeroplane that takes people from A to B. But from a human-centered design perspective, we would say the purpose of the designed aeroplane is to support the pilot and crew who are responsible for taking people from A to B. So taking the same approach to a design of a crime survey, from the traditional perspective, we might say that the purpose of the crime survey research method is to generate data on respondents' experience of crime victimization and fear of crime. But from a human-centered perspective, we might say 
The purpose of the designed research method is to support the practitioners and policymakers who are responsible for tackling and reducing crime victimization and feelings of insecurity. So we would suggest that the feelings of unsafety model developed by CCI not only demonstrates the broad range of factors affecting citizens' feelings of insecurity, but also highlights the limited scope for traditional policing interventions to address this. It highlights that non-law enforcement issues like good urban design, environmental management, responsive maintenance, uh, and effective communication all offer potential for reducing citizens' feelings of unsafety or if done badly, increasing it. So in terms of the measurement issue, the model also suggests alternative approaches to assessing citizens' feelings of insecurity. For example, if you want to use a survey, don't ask questions about feelings after priming your respondents with 50 questions about crime victimization, because you're going to pollute your response. Focus on understanding how behaviours are changing due to feelings of insecurity. And perhaps don't even mention the C word at all. Frame questions so that they reveal respondents' assumptions and biases. Actions speak louder than words. Actions reveal the true intentions and provide a more accurate reflection of a person's beliefs and values than what they might state in any survey. Thank you very much.